Happy Oscar Sunday morning. How are you? Welcome to a fantastic new episode of Collider Mailbag. I am your host, John Roca, joined by one of my favorite people here at Collider and the former host of this show. Look, I'm still getting my feet wet, still figuring this out. I'm so happy Perry was able to come on on this Oscar Sunday to uh, answer these questions from you fans. How are you doing? There is no doubt you're going to find your footing very fast. It's so weird, though. It's just like, <laughs> forget the fact that you did the intro, but even to be sitting in the other chair feels yeah. weird to me. <laughs> well, look, uh, today was Oscar Sunday, and I knew I, I was like, I, I had to angle this thing to get Perry on here. She's very busy, but I wanted her to come on and talk about some of these uh, some of the questions that are Oscars based here. So there'll be two or three. There'll be other questions that are not Oscars based, but I wanted to keep it an Oscars thing. Uh, tell me, Perry, because you host FYC and you're you know we talk about the Oscars all the time off camera. Like how the, what is it about the Oscars that really like just captures your imagination and your love? Well, clearly there's been a couple of announcements recently mm. that that are kind of. Uh not necessarily ruining my uh, my oh, enjoyment right. of yeah, it, but sure. they're kind of like putting a damper on it a little, which is unfortunate <laughs> because the main reason why I like the Oscars and I value what an Oscar stands for is because it's basically the biggest night of the year to celebrate cinema. Right. This is a medium that has completely changed my life. There's certain stories that have been honored at the Oscar that have completely changed my life. And I don't have to say this. I feel like everybody knows I am like so deeply passionate. Movies are just like running through mm. my veins constantly. Constantly. So to have this night when we can recognize everybody from the biggest celebrity out there to someone who worked on the sound mix. Yeah, it's an important time to have people up on that stage celebrating their hard work and what this industry stands for. So I just love that part about it. And I hope they do it in the best possible way. I couldn't have said it. Any, that's fantastic. Couldn't have said it any better. That's, I think it's a perfect encapsulation <laughs> of why so many of us love the Oscars. Well, you know how this show works. We get your questions. You send it in to us using that hashtag collateral our mailbag when we put the posts up on social media on Instagram or on Twitter or you can also email us mailbag at collider.com and hey you don't have to wait for the call out just do it email us uh, at 2 a.m. when you're thinking about a movie question do it send it to us and you never know it might get selected for the show I think you'll like the ones we picked out why don't we uh, get going Perry you, you got ready? some good ones I yeah. like these oh cool all right let's start it off uh, this is first one is an email from Peter Lennon uh, he writes hi Collider crew with Kathy Yan directing Birds of Prey, why hasn't her Sundance film Dead Pigs been picked for distribution? It was warmly received and has obviously impressed Warner Brothers, so it seems strange that it hasn't even been picked up by a streaming service like Netflix or Vimeo. Thanks for taking my question. This is a perfect Perry question. I yeah. Uh, this is a, a sad reality, but mm. this is what happens, particularly at a festival like Sundance. Yes, we were busy celebrating a whole bunch of really big sales this year, but there's yeah. a whole ton of them. I mean, just to pull a few off the top of my head right now. There's this movie that I loved called Animals. I don't believe that mm. was picked up yet. There's another called Before You Know It. I don't think that was picked up yet. So it is the nature of that particular festival. The fact that Dead Pigs paved the way to a big superhero movie yeah, opportunity yeah. and it hasn't gotten distribution, that is a little surprising to me, especially a full year after. This one had a very healthy run on the festival circuit. Mm -hmm. Then it debuted in uh, China, I believe, at the very beginning of this year. I think it is only a matter of time before someone snatches it up, but I think what it might take is for Birds of Prey to come out and yeah. pop, and then all of a sudden someone will snatch it up for their streaming service. But, you know, that is the benefit of doing bigger movies like mm -hmm. that. It draws more attention to your previous work, and then hopefully it opens up doors to other opportunities you might not have had before. Yeah, I think also to consider here is maybe Kathy Ann, maybe they're trying to lowball Kathy, and she doesn't want to have her thing distributed in a certain way. Now that she is a Warner Brothers, slash DC director with Birds of Prey. There's a little more cachet negotiation uh, 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 leverage that she has here. So maybe she hasn't seen an offer that she feels comfortable with surrendering this movie to to be streamed at. I mean, that's always possible too. People think, oh, it's because it hasn't been picked up. It's not good. No, sometimes it's negotiation situations. And Netflix, I've heard from a number of people who've tried to sell their first two or three movies that were in, that Netflix had interest in. The Netflix drives a hard bargain, pays out over years. So those are those things that you don't know behind the 
the scenes that are going on. It's just because a film hasn't been picked up doesn't A, mean it isn't good, or doesn't B, mean the director isn't in demand. It's just a matter of, I think, in the end, negotiation stuff. Distribution um, is hard. Yeah. I yeah really, you know, having done, I really you know. do think that was surprisingly one of the biggest challenges mm. of Child Eater was, you know, it's one thing to say you're going to go make a movie and then you hit the ground running and you're physically on the ground with the people you're working with. And right. then it's after the fact that all of a sudden everything almost comes to a screeching halt. It's like yeah. you've done it and you feel this urge to be like, it's all done. Let's like applaud ourselves. But right. then you got to do the legwork to actually find proper distribution that isn't going to dick you over. Yeah, right. Exactly. Where well, you lose the money mm -hmm. instead of making any money. It's not just about putting it out there. It's about putting it out there in the right way that also like pays you for your time of having spent so many hours on a film. Something like Child yep. Eater, which we talk about how many hours <laughs> you spent on that. All right, let's move on to our next one. All righty. Number two is a Twitter question from Real Mikey H, who writes, Hey, Cloud of Friends, we see many good acting performances through the year, but only a few get nominated for Best Actor Actress Awards. What, in your opinion, differentiates a good performance from an Oscar worthy performance? This is such a great question. I think, it, you know, look, these things are subjective, but just because they're subjective doesn't mean they can't be swept up in a wave of people feeling the same way. That's usually how these nominations come about. Enough people in the voting body go to see these films or get these screeners and see a performance that A, is transcendent or is something they've never seen before or maybe a role they've seen before but done in a way that's incredibly unique and different and you feel drawn to it instinctually or viscerally and that motivates you to nominate that actress for this award. There are plenty of good actresses working nowadays. It's a combination of the role, the script, and the performance that mm -hmm. gets you into that stratosphere. Yeah, I mean, there's a million and one reasons why one performance speaks to me more than mm. another one. But as far as taking a good performance and actually getting yourself an Oscar nomination, there are so many things <laughs> at play. So many things that are in play for particular people and not others. For example, right. you know, this year, I'm not saying Glenn Close's performance in The Wife isn't great, but the fact that not very many out there have seen The Wife compared to, let's say, The Favorite, Mm -hmm. or something like A Star is Born, Glenn Close has a good narrative. So the second you can spin a good narrative out of an Oscar nomination and possibly win, mm -hmm. that puts someone in the game, similar to, to Spike Lee. Right. It's yeah. after all these years, there's a call for him to get that nomination. Yeah. It's a good story. Again, that does not mean I don't think they are deserving. I'm just piecing together all the little, uh, the little elements at play here. But... Also, I find that a good performance can be further elevated when all of the elements in the movie are great around them. Yeah. Yes, you have, let's say, your Rami Malek, who is such a shining star in that movie, but there are certain other scenarios, I think, where when a film is a complete package, it's almost like they all rise together, mm -hmm. that kind of feeling. Yeah. But it speaks to the times, too. Whatever, you know, whatever's going on in the world and whatever uh, kind of makes a little topic pop for people, that yeah. can make all the difference. There's a million and one factors. I think you bring up a great point, and that is the uh, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes in maybe some promotional marketing, pushing that PR stuff, publicist, all of that stuff mm -hmm. comes into play. I mean, not to bring up the name of Weinstein, but that's how he built his name back in those early 90s was those incredibly strong pushes to push the film up. There's people working behind the scenes for every actor or actress out there who wants to get to the next level in terms of award recognition for the roles that they do to put them into certain situations to get highlighted. I think you bring up bring, uh, bring up a great point with Glenn Close. Not a lot of people have seen that movie yet. Somehow she is racking up these awards because the voting body has mm -hmm. seen that movie through screeners or whatever, and it must be a performance that is somewhat transcendent for them to be rewarding. It. Perry's absolutely right. There's a multiple. There's a million and one things that go into it, but you know it when you see it, and when you see it, you hope it gets nominated, and then you hope that person wins. Strong campaign too. I mean, yes. that's one of the sadder truths to me is that. Mm -hmm. There are instances where, let's say, a person delivers great work, but because that movie doesn't have the marketing money, the right. ad dollars behind it, it will never get there. And for whatever reason, Short Term 12 is coming to mind now. Oh, I yeah, think yeah. that that release strategy and what should have been a strong awards push was completely botched and like no one saw that movie. Yeah. <laughs> These are the perils of, of film. What a shame. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to our next question. That's some, It's a Twitter question as well. It's from Jordan Chung. Uh, Jordan Chung's B. HS writes, uh, do you feel being film critics has fine-tuned your taste in the films you end up liking? I feel your average moviegoers are simply unaffected by many of the issues critics have in movies, and
and leading to movies such as Venom and Jurassic World becoming mega hits? Yes and no. Okay. Yet, uh, eh, let's start with no first. Because <laughs> I, I feel like even if I wasn't sitting at this table right now, I would be passionate about film. Absolutely. And I think I would probably more be more critical than the average just because I like paying attention to details. Mm -hmm. But then I obviously have to say yes because it's the nature of our job. Right. We're required to be analytical and not just analytical casually, every single day, nonstop with everything we watch. You know, there's still, I don't think that whole sit back and relax and enjoy the show feeling will never, it, it's never gonna go away, mm -hmm. it's still there. But I think that over the years, like certain senses become honed further and further and it, it kind of just shapes who you are, not necessarily as a critic, but someone who digests art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would thoroughly agree with everything Perry said. I think you have to be, I don't know what it is, but I think you have, an in, have to have an instinctual desire to analyze a film, to criticize a film, to want to find the nuances that the director uh, is trying to bring across or the actor is trying to bring across or even the cinematographer is trying to bring across or the composer. You have to be, you have to have that inside you. Can you learn it? Absolutely. Can you get into the business, figure it out? Sure. But I think for a lot of film critics, it is an instinctual thing from like 10 years old 90s early on when you're watching something you watch your first classic film and you go oh I get it and then you start to explore it more for me it was that age like 10 years old watching old movies and all of a sudden finding an affinity for them and then reading reviews from like Pauline Kael and Leonard Mar Moulton and and Siskel and Ebert and all, like that's what got me going because I had an interest in yeah. it uh, I, but I think yes you can be the average movie go or I can still enjoy a, a guilty pleasure movie but when I go to see a film that supposedly has Oscar buzz or is uh, in contention for Oscar or Awards, then my mind completely turns into a different place and I start to look at it analytically and see what's working here and do the things connect. Uh, that's one of the big things we do on The Cinephiles, that podcast I host with Steve Morris. We break down one film, sometimes from, Perry's been on it with Jurassic I Park. Have. You've seen it sometimes. It's two to three to four hours where we dissect a movie because we have a natural affinity and desire to. Now, that being said, Jurassic World, yeah, we're fine-tuned in that way because we like it. And of course, people hear fine-tuning, like I listen to Perry's or, or Snyder's reviews or anybody that I respect here in the, in the sphere that we're in and go, oh, I didn't catch it. Like Drew McWeeny, mm -hmm. I will read Drew McWeeny's reviews and go, my God, I feel like an infant in my analysis of movies when I read some of his reviews. And that, so it does fine tune you, but it doesn't take away the joy. Well, that right there, I think, is the reason why we have so many critics. And while mm. I do, you know, encourage you if you have found someone that usually aligns with how you feel to stick right. to them and always read them. But that's the beauty of film criticism, criticism is that you can get so many different opinions. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is we all come at it from a different angle. So yeah. the fact that he discovered something you didn't doesn't mean you're wrong. Right, it means right. he saw something and maybe you saw something that he didn't. Did and, and that's why that's why we have questions mm -hmm. like this too because yep. that kind of sends that need to talk about it bubbling over and I think that was the first step in it for me was when all of a sudden I started to see movies and I'm like like who, who do I talk to about that I, I have to talk about it now and now here we are now everybody can talk about it now on multiple <laughs> platforms all right let's move on to our next one all righty it is an email question from bro Basti who writes I am Sebastian from Germany and I want wondered if you could give me some advice and some help. Many of you have a background in the movie industry as producers, screenwriters, etc. Since I'm graduating next year, congratulations, I should start planning what to do after school. Obviously, I want to follow my dream of making movies and acting. So do you have any advice and ideas how to start my journey to become a filmmaker and or actor in the U.S.? Where should I go? What should I do? Film schools, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Thanks for your answer and the Collider content. It's always a great time listening to you greetings from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, well, guten tag. I think that's how you say it in German. Um, listen, these are great questions that you're asking. I'm sure Perry and I had these questions as we were walking into our own uh, business or our mm -hmm. own industry, figuring out where we were going to go. How are we going to do this? And you know, there are multiple paths. There's no one way to get to where you're going. I think you have to trust your instincts. I think you have to be very clear about what you want and also be malleable that what you want may change and be okay with that and have the strength to make that decision or make that jump when it shows up for you and you got to be willing to work hard. Yes, some people walk into a situation and they're lucky, but most people have to work 
all the time to get there and really hone it and don't, you know, and sacrifice financially, sacrifice time oh with friends and yeah, you know, time with friends and family, what have you. You have to be willing because you got to want it. And only what, two to 10% of the people who try to make it in this business actually make it in this business and then stay successful in this business. So that's what I would say to you in terms of film schools or whatever, you can do your research online and figure out what works for you, what doesn't work for you. But in the long run, you got to have that desire. And when the first hurdle comes for you and you feel like you can't make it, then you got to have a question, a conversation with yourself about how much you really want it. Mm -hmm. You probably said it at the very beginning there, but everybody's yeah. path is different. Yeah. And I feel like I get a lot of people asking me if they should go to film school. And I find it's a challenging question to answer because I went to film school. I am so freaking thankful that I went to film school and there's no way I would be in the same position without that experience. Mm. But I also know tons of people out there who didn't want to spend all those thousands of dollars to get a degree and rather went right into it and started working. And that was their school. So yeah. I really don't think there's a right answer to any of these questions here. But, you know, thinking a little bit about what you had described and how my uh, my inner dialogue regarding mm. whether or not I should go to film school. Oh, my. <laughs> I mean, really, whether you answer these questions the same way I did or not, yeah. none of those answers are easy to find. Uh, my poor mother would tell anybody that the amount that I chewed her ear off or go, oh, should I go to film school? If, if I step away from the online criticism world, I'm going to lose all my opportunities. Maybe I shouldn't do it. And then it was just back and forth yep. and back and forth until one day it was almost like a rip the bandaid off moment where I had my acceptance and I just submitted it. I was committed. Mm -hmm. I was going and I'm, I'm freaking thankful that I made that decision. But yeah. then again, that was me. That is not everybody else. Right. And it's the, what well, you spoke about, I think right at the end there, commitment is you have to have the commitment. Yeah. That's really the number one thing. And look, you may start out down a path fully committed to it, and then eventually it'll show itself to you whether it's your path or not. You'll know instinctively. Everyone has their own thing inside that uh, you know that tells them where to go. You'll know instinctively if it's the right path for you to keep pursuing. Like for me, I was acting out here for 12 years and I didn't realize how much I wasn't happy doing stuff in front of the camera in the long run, sitting in the trailer, mm -hmm. waiting to be called on to set, you know, like having my days pushed, uh, uh, you know, going to the auditions, having to negotiate my work schedule with other jobs that I was doing so I'd go to these auditions on the chance that I might get something and eventually I just burnt out and didn't want to do it anymore and I don't miss it there's not a day that goes by that I miss mm -hmm. it uh, voiceover wise yes I love doing that that's a that's a blast but on camera I don't miss it and Christian luckily enough like this avenue opened up and I was able to pursue it and I was luck and I'm lucky to be here through the hard work and commitment but that's what it takes is the commitment being open to seeing if changes are happening and going forward with those changes never uh Never quit, though. Yeah, I feel like there's yes. a very big difference, and it's sometimes difficult to realize the difference between thinking you want something, mm. where whereas maybe it's more the easy way out. Because I'll never forget my first semester in film school. I don't know if I've ever actually told you this. No. I was one of very few in the program who had no filmmaking background. I had never made a movie, and I also didn't have an undergrad degree in film. Right. So I was really one of the on only people there going in completely cold. Huh. And in my program, they make you take screenwriting, directing, and producing, regardless of which track you're going to pursue throughout the entire thing. So it was directing one, and the first assignment was a silent film with two people in it, and my film was a big steaming pile of trash. It was the <laughs> worst thing in the world. Later on when I graduated, it got nominated for, like, the worst of this class oh, wow. kind of thing. It the was, Razzies it was <laughs> awful. I was so embarrassed, and the teacher yeah. was, was so hard on me, which turned out to be more of, like, a constructive criticism type right. thing, thankfully. But I'll never forget walking away from that class and telling my roommate at the time, I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. I think I have to quit. I think this is, I think this is just it. I'm going to leave. <laughs> and then I got another, uh, another exercise assignment in that, in that class and like little bits improved, improved. Yeah. And I wound up with a final film in that particular class that I was very proud of. So I don't know. Sometimes if you're like, you're super stressed and you're thinking about quitting, just take a step back, try to assess whether it's that kind of thing where you really do know deep down to your core yeah. that you know, it's not right for you or, are you just kind of feeling bad for yourself? Because yeah. that's what I was doing. Yeah, and everybody fails. Everybody fails, everybody falls down, everybody stumbles. 
you're going to confront that. And that's what, what Perry's talking about. Like, this movie also taught her, like, what the lessons going forward. Donut Showdown. Call it by its name. <laughs> was Donut Showdown. Donut Showdown. I love that. <laughs> well, oh I'm going to dig that out. I have I'm gonna to gonna find that. To Jesus, I want to see that. A, sl- a, a silent movie called Donut Showdown. That's just perfect. <laughs> Kathy Ann, you think you can't get picked up. This needs to get picked up. Uh, all right, let's get to our last question. Uh, it's an Instagram question from Jonathan Rios. Oh, by the way, uh, to Bro Basti, good luck. From both yes, of us. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, this is the last question. Instagram from Jonathan Rios. He asks, out of all the movies that have won Best Picture from the Academy, which one is the most deserving that you feel defines what an Oscar winner should be? What movie, nominated or not, do you feel deserve the Oscar now that time has let the movie age like a fine wine? I can't answer this quite like I think the question was intended. Because okay. I, I sat there and I thought about it for a while and I scrolled through all the Best Picture yeah, winners yeah. and I really sat there and thought about it. And I think the roadblock I kept hitting was that... I think every year it's something different. And Mm. right now, my biggest thing is basically spreading opportunity and bold storytelling throughout the industry. And I know it's the easy answer to go with The Shape of Water, but it it feels like The Shape of Water represents what I want the Oscars to be right at this very moment. Mm -hmm. But let's say if I were to go back 10 years ago, I would find a different reason for that. Mm -hmm. I'd find a reason for Casablanca, Forrest Gump, Silence of the Lambs, you name it. But at this point in time, I think one of the most exciting things to me in this industry is how many different types of stories Stories we're seeing told by different types of people with different backgrounds, and I love seeing that represented on that stage come Oscar night. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Perry. And I think it stems, in my personal opinion, it seems like it stems from that 90s independent movie explosion. So many kids or people who were watching movies at that time saw so many different points of views being shown in independent films and uh, occasionally on uh, studio films about different uh, points of view, different people, different experiences in life. And now we see these expanded approaches to movie uh, making with bold storylines, with interesting characters, with a fish man <laughs> sleeping with a, a human. And what does that all and, and all, talking about love, though, in a very naked and honest way. And so that has to have expanded because we were like pretty, pretty much doing the, the, the stuff that we were doing in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And yes, yeah, 70s were very bold as well in the political mm. stuff and showing the un- ugly underbelly of the American dream. But the 80s and the 90s and then that that mid-90s explosion of independent films, I think that changed the uh, and opened the door for so many filmmakers who maybe didn't think they would have a voice or find a voice in this industry. Um, I would go back to Lawrence. Ver- that, to me, is the penultimate Best Picture winner for so mm-hmm. many reasons. A, because of the cinematography, David Lean's direction, Peter O'Toole's acting, the scope of the movie, the fact that it is three hours and 45 minutes long, and for me, having seen it maybe 20 or 30 times, uh, at least in the theater, it is never Never gotten old for me. Uh, I know it's Dennis Zhang's one of I was going to say. I bet Dennis would agree with you on this. <laughs> uh, the other one I would throw in there, though, as I was looking through all these, is uh, In the Heat of the Night. And mm. I say this because In the Heat of the Night, although maybe not the most outstandingly directed film, it's a film that captures a time and speaks about uh, a racism at a time in the '60s when we were still coming to terms with it as a country. And you have a scene where uh, Sidney Poitier, a strong black detective who is out of his element in a southern town slaps a rich white man in his arboreum and it's like oh my god and in 68 seeing that happen in front of a cop what that must have been like at the time for race relations in this country so i think these films the best pictures capture a time in our world and then show us how we can move forward together you know because rod steiger and sydney portier eventually come together put away their preconceived notions about each other then work together to solve this case and that is really the lesson from that movie and i think that's what the greatest best picture films do is leave you with a lesson that you bring into your own Mm -hmm. life. Um, I don't know about a lesson, but Mm. I would definitely put The Dark Knight in there. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean... one that didn't win. It wasn't nominated. Yeah, it wasn't even nominated, but, like, you took it from, from like, a very, like, deep meaning Mm. place, and mine's more of uh, a reflection on the industry, which seems to be what I'm drawn to with this question, but... 
that was that was the moment to be able to show the world that superhero movies are different and they're yeah. high quality and sometimes they can deserve a spot amongst all of these other films that are more typical types of Oscar packages right. and it doesn't matter how many times I watch that movie I'll still never get over the fact that it didn't get a best picture nomination <laughs> especially with the other accolades yeah. God, it's it seemed like such a shame like such a missed opportunity and then I start to spiral out of control by trying to play out my mind what might have happened and how the industry might be different oh, yeah. today had that gotten a nomination and I mean I, I can't even explain it to you guys right now because I've gone <laughs> down so many different paths but there's no doubt in my mind that we would be talking about superhero movies in a very different way I don't know if it's for better or worse mm -hmm. but the conversation would be very different had that had the Best Picture nomination. Yeah, well, and we may find out tonight, Perry, that a superhero film wins Best Picture. Who knows? And I think all the I'm films... I'm not betting on it, no, for the record, enough, but I'm enough. glad it's in the pack. <laughs> yeah, but we have so many different types of films nominated this year that mm -hmm. it speaks to the expanse of the of the films that are out there for people to watch and enjoy and get Can nominated. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Who are you rooting for tonight? Oh, uh... If you had to pick just one movie in any of the races to root for, and you could pick one movie that's mm -hmm. in multiple races, if you want but okay. what are you rooting for more than anything i i know people are going to come at me and slam me but i i am rooting for black panther for a number of reasons and i would normally root for roma because it's a you know it's a spanish language movie it's, it's set in mexico it's an incredible direct a latin director i normally i would be cheering for roma like crazy but i want to see what mm -hmm. happens if black panther wins and what happens to the industry as a result and if this is the cataclysmic change that people anticipate it's going to be if it wins i would be happy to see black panther win yeah. but the movie that i'm rooting for <laughs> above all else yes you know what it is break it down jurassic park no what is it nice try it's the favorite yeah the favorite yeah i i really just don't want the favorite to be one of those movies that's Nominated in so many categories and barely walks off with any wins. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think Coleman has a real shot to take this thing? Do you think Glenn Close just has it in the back? Yeah, I I do think this is Glenn Close's award to okay. lose. I know since Coleman's BAFTA win, I've read a couple of uh, folks out there mm -hmm. in uh, award season pundits who have tried to kind of spin the narrative in a way where it's closing the gap between the two of them, yeah, but. Yeah. I, I don't think it's close enough at this point. And I also think the further we got into award season, the more A Star is Born slipped away as oh, far as yeah. wins go. So yeah. I don't even think Lady Gaga is that close anymore. Oh, that's fair. Well, so I'm we'll going Glenn Close tonight. All right, we'll find out tonight, that's for sure. I just think it's amazing. Olivia Coleman, my girlfriend is a massive British television fan. So to see all the different shows that she has watched Olivia Coleman on, I'm catching up on and being like, wow, this is from doing something like this to being an Oscar nominated actress for best it's pretty incredible she's so, so good in that movie exactly, even if she I doesn't win it. I think it's great that she was even nominated it's fantastic and we'll get to see her more and more in other projects and that's a good win mm -hmm. all around alright well thanks everybody for taking uh, time to watch us on this wonderful Oscars Sunday for this edition of Collider Mailbag thank you to Perry Nemeroff for stopping thank you by thank for having me happy Oscar night thank happy you. Oscar night to everybody out there can I plug the, uh, the plug Oscar everything plug? please I was just you, about to ask you. you guys we got so much Oscar coverage coming your way. I swear I will be a little more well dressed later, but we're gonna do we're gonna do a pre-show, yep. we're gonna do a live stream, and then we got a post show. Oh boy, we're gonna cover everything. Yeah, I'll I'm be so watching, excited. I'll be watching from London. I'll be in London watching the Oscars and watching that coverage. You just from snap Collider, your so. fingers after the show and poof, you're that's in right, London. That's right. That's right. Poof. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm getting on a jet right now. That's it's what that's waiting saying. outside. It's waiting outside. All right. Well, thanks everybody. You can follow Perry, Perry Nemiroff at P Nemiroff. You can follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. And don't forget, please send those questions in when we put the call out or email them whenever you want. Include that hashtag Collider Mailbag on social media. Media or email us at collider at mailbag, mailbag, sorry, mailbag. Dot com, mailbag dot com. Oh, that's the Roka version of mailbag. I We're going to call it, it mailbag. <laughs> There it is. It's perfect. Collider at mailbag.com or mailbag at collider.com. There it is. All right. Send it there. Damn it. I almost made the whole show without making a mistake. All right. Mailbag at collider.com. Send them in and we might select them on the show. All right. Have a great uh, Sunday. Thank you to Adam Smith for uh, doing the show and we will talk to you soon.